No comment! Sir, what about the ending to The Rising? Mother f What part of no comment don't you understand? Do you understand this? This interview is over! No comment! The f Brian Keane was also unavailable for comment. And welcome back once again to The Horror Show with Brian Keene, brought to you by the Project Entertainment Network and available, as always, for free on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, and all other platforms. I am, of course, your host, Brian Keene. A reminder that I am solo once again this week. Uh, next week, our co-hosts will be back with us and we'll be back in the studio and things will sound a little better, but for today... I'm by myself, just me and Max the cat and a laptop and uh, an old microphone. Uh, we're going to continue with our reading series this week. I will be reading from my short story collection, Blood on the Page, the complete short fiction of Brian Keene, Volume 1. I'll also be reading from my short story collection, All Dark, All the Time, the complete short fiction of Brian Keene, Volume 2. Both of those books are available in trade paperback, as well as for Kindle, Nook, and Kobo. So if you like what you hear, please, by all means, go out and buy a copy. Uh, our first story is from Blood on the Page. This is called, I Sing a New Psalm. Blessed is the man who has never known the love of God, for he will never know the pain of a broken heart. And blessed is the man who lives in ignorance of the forces around him, for he can exist in peace. I was such a man once. I didn't know the love of God, for I did not believe in him. God was something for superstitious people. He was like the Tooth Fairy or Santa Claus. God was a story told to children to give them comfort when someone they loved had died. Rover is in heaven now, sweetheart. He's playing catch with God, and one day, if you're good and eat all your vegetables and follow the Ten Commandments, you'll see him again. Just like if you're good, Santa Claus will bring you a new toy. Growing up, that was all I knew of God. I did not believe in God or the Tooth Fairy or Santa Claus. I believed in working hard and succeeding at my job and becoming a partner with the firm. These values were instilled in me at a young age by my father. He worked seven days a week with one day off for Christmas and a week off for deer season. My father loved me, and although I didn't see much of him growing up, I know that he worked those hours for me. He wanted me to be the first person in our family to go to college. John Lennon once said that a working class hero is something to be. He was gunned down by a fan who loved him. John Lennon was more popular than Jesus. My father died of a heart attack before I finished law school. My mother followed a year later from melanoma. Years after the initial grief passed, I still felt unsettled when I thought of their passing. It bothered me how they would never know of my accomplishments or how I'd repaid my father's unselfish work ethic in an equally driven manner. He would never know of these things because he didn't exist anymore. I did not believe in God or heaven. My father was not with the, the father. He was simply dead, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Would they have been proud of me? My co-workers had a party for me the night I was offered a role as full partner with the firm. I drank too much scotch. Head swimming, I returned home to an empty apartment. There was no solace to be found in the silence. Despite my achievements, I was left unfulfilled. Blessed is the man who finds the love of a good partner, for that is the key to fulfillment. 
I did not find fulfillment at a singles bar or on a dating website or in any of the other places one goes to find love these days. I found it in a church. I found fulfillment in Valerie. We met at a wedding. She was a bridesmaid and I was a guest of the groom. I still remember how beautiful she looked in her soft baby blue chiffon gown. Sunlight came through the stained glass windows and sparkled in her chestnut hair. At the reception, we made small talk over the punch bowl. Later, we danced the chicken dance and the electric slide and all the other wedding staples. And at the end of the evening, we exchanged phone numbers. What did Valerie see in me? A lost soul, ripe for saving? Her Christian duty? Was it a forbidden attraction, perhaps? A chance to just tiptoe over the line to the wild side with a secular atheist type like myself? No, it was none of these things. When she looked in my eyes, I like to think that she saw mirrored the same things that I saw in her. Blessed is the man who finds love, for love is the greatest gift of them all. The Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. I started going to church with Valerie, not out of a desire to know God, but out of a desire to please her. I loved her, and it was important to her, and I wanted to make her happy. We went each Sunday, but I did not feel the Lord. We sat in the pew together and shook hands with those around us, but I did not feel the Lord. I wrapped an arm around Valerie as we shared a hymnal and sang, but I did not feel the Lord. I read aloud from the bulletin with the rest of the congregation, but I did not feel the Lord. I sat dutifully, listening to the scripture lesson and the sermon each week, but I did not feel the Lord. I tithed, but you guessed it, I did not feel the Lord. When I asked her to marry me, she asked if it would be forever. When I said yes, she asked me to accept Christ as my personal Lord and Savior, to ask him to come into my heart so that I could be born again. Valerie said this was the only way we could be together in the world beyond this one. She asked me if I would do this one thing, and I said yes. That was the only time I ever lied to her. We were married on the last Saturday of March. We stood at the altar in front of our friends and our family and God, and when I looked into Valerie's eyes and heard the emotion in her voice when she said, I do, I almost felt the Lord. And then Mark came along. Mark was born four years later, after a struggle to conceive and many visits to fertility clinics and adoption agencies. Valerie was in labor for 25 hours. The doctors finally decided on cesarean delivery. I knelt beside her in the operating room, whispering into her ear, kissing her forehead. She squeezed my hand and told me that she loved me. And then the doctor asked me if I'd like to see my son. I peeked up over the curtain, and there were Valerie's insides. The skin of her stomach had been folded back like a bedspread, and her insides were on display. The overhead lights glistened on the red and purple and yellow and brown, but this barely registered with me, for there, in the doctor's hands, was our son. There was Mark. And then, then I felt the Lord. I felt his goodness and his love, and I wept for joy, and I praised his name and gave thanks. I prayed. I apologized for my foolish disbelief. I made amends for doubting, for surely here was proof of his providence and his love. I wept happily, and my chest swelled as if my heart would burst. An alarm blared over my cry, and through my tears I realized something was wrong. Mark was blue, and when I tried to go to him, the nurse whisked him away. Valerie squeezed my hand, but her grip was weak, and when she moaned, I heard the fear in her voice. Then her hand slipped away and the staff pushed me aside. The alarms grew louder, drowning out my prayers. Later, after the alarms had faded and the lights had dimmed and the staff had muttered their sincere apologies, a doctor came to me. I was kneeling in the hospital's chapel. The doctor was a short, rotund man with a receding hairline and a gentle, kindly face. He pushed his glasses up on his nose and cleared his throat softly. He offered his condolences on the death of my son. I asked him if there was any update on Valerie's condition. And the doctor said, We've done all we can. She's in God's hands now. Valerie died two hours after Mark did. I tried to pray for them both, but my voice was a harsh, ragged thing, and my words were ugly. 
My God, my God, why have you done this to me? Why did you give me the fruits of your love and show me the path to your light, only to then rip them away? Why are you so far from helping me? Do you hear the words of my roaring? I cry in the daytime, but you don't hear me. I beg to you at night, but you don't answer. For the Lord our God is a jealous God. He is a demanding God. You shall have no other gods before him, and you shall love no other like you love him. He demands this of us, his creation. John Lennon once said that happiness is a warm gun. He was gunned down by a fan who loved him. John Lennon was killed because he was more popular than Jesus. There was a small bell over the door of the gun store that jingled when I walked inside. It sounded like the chimes of freedom ringing, a heavenly chorus. I bought a shotgun and two handguns, and while we waited for the results of my background check, I asked the proprietor if he clung to God and guns the way our former president had suggested. We all need something to believe in, he said. But I don't care what they say. I didn't vote for either candidate. None of them have our best interests at heart. The people in charge never hear us. Well, you shall hear the words of my roaring. How long did you plan to ignore me, O Lord? Forever? How long did you plan to hide your face from me? How long must I counsel my own soul, so utterly filled with crippling sorrow in my heart daily? How long do you expect to be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord. Look in my eyes before I sleep the sleep of death. I will sing unto you, Lord, because you have dealt unfairly with me. Later, they will say that I have prevailed against you, for I trusted in your mercy, and you spat in my face. My heart will rejoice in your pain. You gave, and then you took away. Blessed is the man who can play that game as well, motherfucker. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I do not fear you, for Valerie and Mark are with me. My shotgun and my pistols, they comfort me. Blessed is the man who knows the satisfying weight of such an instrument in his hands. And blessed is the man who finds solace in the handguns holstered to his hips. He shall take comfort in such weapons, and through them he will know fulfillment. I wait in the car as the parishioners file into the church. I watch the greeters shake their hands. And I remember when it was Valerie and me walking through those doors. Eventually the doors close. I wait until I hear the muted sound of the organ. And when the congregation begins to sing, I get out of the car. The guns are heavy, but my heart is light. I feel at peace. Hear this, all you people. Give ear, all you inhabitants of the world. Listen. To the words of my roaring, for I shall sing a new psalm. In the end, uh, that story. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about it. It cannibalizes portions of the first chapter of a novel of mine that I'd never finished. Uh, that novel was called First Person Shooter. Uh, as you can probably guess by the story, it was not a fun or easy thing to write. It took me to very dark places, and that's probably why I never finished it. Um, the creation of this short story had the same impact on me. When I do readings or personal appearances across the country, I often choose this story to perform for the crown for the crowd, and it's always well received. Uh, a lot of readers over the years have told me it's one of their favorites, so that makes the pain of its creation worth it. But yeah, not an easy story to write, and definitely not an easy story to read. Again, that is, I sing a new psalm, and it is from Blood on the Page. The Complete Short Fiction of Brian Keene, Volume 1. We will now switch over to All Dark, All the Time, The Complete Short Fiction of Brian Keene, Volume 2. And we're going to read a story called uh, Something Pretty, but I need to find it first. So we're checking the table of contents. This is live radio here, folks. Okay, here we go. Something Pretty. We had just finished up lunch at that Asian place you liked so much. You had the sushi sampler, and I stuck with General So's chicken, because ever since the Fukushima nuclear disaster, eating sushi makes me nervous. But so do a lot of other things. Lately, I seem to be nervous all the time. 
Sometimes it's little things. While we were eating lunch, I watched the chef carving radishes into perfect little flowers to be used as a decorative garnish. It was amazing to behold the work of a true artist, and I should have enjoyed it, but instead, all I did was worry that he was going to cut himself and ruin our perfect afternoon. Usually, though, it's the bigger things I worry about. I can't go to the movies without being afraid that some nut will shoot the place up. I can't go to the mall or the grocery store or ride public transit without worrying about it happening there, too. I'm concerned about the Yellowstone caldera. You know about that, the big volcano? They say it's overdue to blow, and when it does, most of the United States will be covered in volcanic ash. And an asteroid could hit us at any time, so there's that. I'm afraid of our government and of law enforcement and how we're living in a militarized police state, but nobody seems to give a shit. I'm terribly frightened of cancer. It's not enough just to quit smoking these days or, you know, not breathe in asbestos and smog. No, cancer's in our vaccines now and in this GMO processed shit that we eat and in the water we drink and the electronics that fill our homes with Wi-Fi signals. In 20 years, everyone who's ever used a cell phone is going to be dying of brain tumors and none of them seem to care. And don't even get me started on how diseases are beginning to mutate to the point where our antibiotics don't work against them anymore. I mean, that's terrifying. But mostly, I'm nervous about growing old and about those I love growing old with me. I hate change. I absolutely despise it. And yet, change is the one constant in this world of ours. And what a putrid, rotten, messed up world it is. More and more, it seems like everything that is good and beautiful is being trampled under the feet of a million marching sheep, bleeding along to their own meaningless pop culture distractions and oblivious to their own onrushing extinction. We humans are an ugly race. Except for you. You're still beautiful. Flawless. And I want you to stay that way. When it came time to settle the check, I reached for my wallet. You put your hand on my wrist, so warm and so soft, and told me it was your turn to pay. I protested, but not too much. Never too much, because it's hard to deny you anything. Any rational thought I might have get just drowns in your beauty. I offered to at least get the tip, but you laughed in that way you do, that way that sounds like music, and you told me not to worry about it. After all, you said, we're both struggling artists. You told me if I really wanted to pay you back, I could make you something pre pretty. Not buy you something pretty, because the starving artist bit often prevents that. No, you said to make you something pretty. And here we are, six hours later, and you're spread out on the bed before me, more beautiful now than ever before. I wish you could see yourself, but I guess you can't. Especially after I turned your eyes into flower buds and your eyelids into gently curling petals. I got the idea while watching the chef make those radish roses at the restaurant. You said to make you something pretty. So I did. I turned you into a floral bouquet. I made you something pretty. Even prettier than you were before. And I'm not nervous about you growing old anymore. Or about your beauty fading with time. I'm not worried about you changing because there's nothing left to change. Oh, your colors might fade eventually. And I never knew there were so many different shades of red, but that happens with all flowers. What's important is that you enjoy them while they last. I like this new outlook on life. I'm not scared anymore, and in a few days after I've enjoyed your beauty a while longer, I'm going to go out into the world and see what other changes I can stop with this knife. The end. So again, that is uh, Something Pretty. It is from All Dark, All the Time, The Complete Short Fiction of Brian Keene, Volume 2. If you have the book in front of you, it says that that story is for, for Casey Lansdale, and it is. Um, <laughs> the way I got the, the idea for the story, Casey and I had uh, gone out to this Asian restaurant in Lancaster. It's a, it's a popular place for horror writers. Uh, J.F. Gonzalez and Chet Williamson and I used to meet there once a week for lunch. Uh, I still eat there. Chet eats there. Robert Swartwood eats there. Um, Mary eats there. You know, we, we often frequent the place. Um, so Casey was on tour for uh, an album that she had just released at the time called Restless. Uh, it was her second country music album. And uh, we had decided that we were going to do a signing at a local store. Now that store is owned by my friends Bill and Ned. And it's a comic book store. And uh, one of the first signings they ever had there back in the day 
was Joe Lansdale and Tim Truman. And here we are, you know, some 25 years later, and Casey's in town, and I said, well, wouldn't it be cool to have another Lansdale sign at that store? So that's what we did. Um, and beforehand, we, as I said, we went to the Asian restaurant. Um, and, and some bits of that story are true in that, uh, you know, when it, when it came time to pay the check, uh, I offered, and Casey put her hand on mine and said, no, I'll pay it. You, if you want to pay me back, make me something pretty. So I said, all right. And, uh, you know, uh, she hit the road the next day. She went back out on tour, and I sat down, and I wrote this story. Uh, so I, I paid her back for lunch with this story, something pretty. So that's it for this week, short show. Um, but you know what? That's not so bad once in a while, a short show. Before we go, I want to remind you that our first book club selection of 2019 is uh, Cannibalistic, no, not Cannibal, Ritualistic Human Sacrifice by C.V. Hunt. Uh, buy it right now, read it, and uh, you can do the book club with us. That will be at the end of January. And as I said, everybody will be back next week. Uh, and by everybody, I mean Dave. Um, I'm hoping Matt and Mary will be with us as well. Uh, I'm not sure yet what their schedules are. But I'll be here, and uh, we'll get back to a regular show rather than these readings. But I, I do hope that you've enjoyed the readings. Just wanted to do something a little different uh, here at the beginning of the year. And I enjoyed doing them. I hope you enjoyed listening to them. Uh, one more time, I want to thank the Project Entertainment Network. They make this show as well as 19 other podcasts available every week uh, on Spotify and iTunes and YouTube and elsewhere. The best way to support them is to become their sponsor on Patreon. Uh, if you just give them $1 a month, that helps them out. I should mention, there is an exclusive episode of The Horror Show available only on that Patreon. The only way you can get it is to subscribe to their Patreon. So that might be worth checking out just for that reason alone. All right, folks, uh, we will see you next time. Bye. What kind of stars can you hear each week on the Curtain Jerkers Wrestling Podcast? Booker Max Burton proceeds over our panel of wrestling analysts. Ring announcer Walter Ball. South Florida indie correspondent Steve Mesa. Northeast indie correspondent the Viking Brian Burton. Classic feuds dissected. Fridays at 6.05 on Superstation PEN.